Okay, so you return the rules of personal documentary filmmaking, and you can see these on Doug's blog, Doug Block's blog, which is dblock.typepad.com. Uh, actually, just dougblock.com. Oh, it's Doug, it goes the same oh. Okay, so I'm going to read Imagine. these out, and, and I may read a line to, from the blog post around them, and then you pipe up if there's something you want to say, and if not, we'll move on to the next one. Rule number one, don't make it all about you, even though, of course, it's all about you. Uh, and you talk about how in our culture, you know, you say, uh, in any of, of their art form, critics and audiences seek out personal works. Anyone with a reasonably dysfunctional family can pen a best-selling memoir. In the theater, many of our on honored playwrights, uh, Tennessee Williams, Eugene O'Neill, write fully <coughs> disguised autobiographies. But for some reason, first-person ducks are, cre are greeted with crossed arms, prove it to me scowls, and an attitude of, who the fuck are you to be putting your life up on the screen? Is that an experience you had? Yes. Okay. I mean, it is. I, I, I think it's true. It's, it's weird. I, I think it has something to do with this image of turning a camera lens around on yourself. If not literally, I think sort of metaphorically. But there's something seemingly very narcissistic and self-indulgent about that. Do you think people in America hate it more than people in Europe? No. People no, in Europe people hate it just as much? People in England hate it. Okay. I mean, they really, I'm sure. Like, you know, but like you can people get right in Scandinavian stuff kind of like I, You know, I think if it's a good, I think if it's not told well, you'll get raked over the coals everywhere. Okay. Okay. Good there's, there's, I have some of the worst documentaries I've ever seen by far are badly done personal documentaries where people are working out their therapy right. on camera, which is another Which is point thing. number two. Rule number two, a personal doc is not your personal therapy. Spare us, go and see a good shrink, and save a ton of money in the process. Or write a book, or write a, you know, an article. I mean, there's just plenty of other ways to work out your gripes, with, particularly with your family. Um, it can be gruesome, and it's, you know, I think you just have to have a framework, a story that, that, that works really well to frame that in. And, you know, anyway, that is followed up by a couple other things. Okay, rule number three. Don't tell us your feelings, show or indicate your feelings. So don't talk about it, don't say, now that Lucy's leaving, I'm feeling really unhappy, right? Yeah, yeah, I just don't think that's as interesting as um, just showing Lucy leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's sort of basic storytelling 101, mm -hmm. you know, do it, show, don't tell. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought it was particularly important with 51 Birch Street. Um, you know, like, you know, a, a bunch of people laughed when you saw my father kiss his bride. <laughs> um, you know, it just wouldn't have been so interesting if I just went, oh my god. You know, or or really just well, we're directly so, we're said what I was feeling. You. Well, you know, I went to my sisters and right. I said, so how did you feel when they, right. you know, uh, I timed it by the way, it was like 12 seconds. You know, or 11 and a half seconds longer than dad ever kissed mom. You know, you want to find indirect ways of, of showing how you feel rather than explicitly stating it. Just mm -hmm. more, like I said, more interesting, I think, more cinematic. So rule number four actually is about that the wedding scene too, for me. Rule number four is a sense of humor is essential, especially self-deprecating humor. And I've written, for an example of this, I suggest you watch the scene of Doug dancing at his father's wedding. <laughs> Because it's quite, I mean, you kind of look like a goofball. Well, it's another role. You've got to make yourself look worse than anybody else. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, whether, however you feel on the spectrum of liking or hating Michael Moore's work, I mean, particularly with his first film, uh, Roger and Me, but in almost all his films, he's, he's kind of a genius at, uh, you know, kind of the exposition of his own character. Um, as a self-deprecating man of the people, um, uh, he, you know, he knows how to poke fun at himself and his image, and that carries, you know, and, and, and so you drop that, you know, what I feel is like that initial resistance of who are you um, to tell us your story. I mean, one of the reasons 51 Bird Street, those first 10 minutes were a killer to do was Actually, nothing happens story-wise in the film until my mother dies, and that's 10 minutes into the film. And I just worried endlessly that, you know, oh my God, how are people gonna like stand watching this for 10 minutes when nothing is happening? I just felt, plus 
they, they just hate you mm -hmm. for you know, having the, the gall to tell your own stories if you're interesting. So that weighed very, very heavily on my mind for a long time. Uh, rule number so five humor was kind of the way I tried to do it. Rule number five, which is also in Birch Street, is put your story in context. And we talked about sort of what's universal, why would a viewer in France or Japan care about this? But then you say, even if your film is primarily about your family, what are the larger themes? Is there something about the time period or the setting that can be further explored? Right. Well, in 51 Birch Street, we just cut the family story first. And, and uh, I remember we, we were pretty much done with a big, with a, with a first rough cut of that. And we took a Christmas break. We took two weeks and all, my, my editor and I and the, my producing partner, um, Laurie Cheadle, who has a directing background. You know, we all convened and sort of talked about what we felt about the film. And we all felt like, you know, it's good, but there's something missing. And we couldn't quite figure out what it was at first, but ultimately decided that it needed more context in terms of the time period and the setting and this whole idea that my parents were of this, you know, kind of first generation of, of people who grew up, you know, post-war generation that grew up in cities and moved out to the suburbs. Um, and what must it have been like for my mother, you know, who was just this very kind of cultured city kid mm -hmm. who had three kids in four years and is stuck in this suburb um, being, you know, a housewife and mother, which she's like totally unequipped to be mm -hmm. in many ways. And, um, and it didn't take a lot. It was sort of the last thing we addressed with the film. We got a couple of archival clips, a few photos. Um, and um, it was just a bit of tweaking. And it's so interesting because, you know, when you read something like the New York Times Review, he compares the film to the works of Updike and Cheever in terms of, you know, suburban angst. And I'm going, dude, if you only knew, this was like <laughs> an afterthought. <laughs> but that's somehow... That would that took it to a different another level and made it more universal. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, and this one we talked about, but you say don't make yourself out to be better than your main characters. At the end of the day, you're the one doing the editing. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's almost my primary rule, which is, I mean, it's just a sort of disaster. I think if you try and come off as any better than other, you know, other people in the film, that you try and make yourself look good. And that's your goal in the film. I think actually you have to be prepared to look worse than anyone in the film. <laughs> and you do that very well. I do film. it so naturally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then you say, if you're in it, don't overstay your welcome. I think we all know what that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but again, do you rely on your editor to say like? It helps. Help? It helps to have a good editor. Right. Um, you know, I. Oh God, I can't believe I'm going to tell this story. Um, there was just a moment in the editing of 51 Bird Street where it just didn't seem, it, it's very subtle, the change in my relationship with my father in that film. I mean, even now, looking for it, it's very hard to tell when it shifted. And I really worried about that, whether it was going to come across. I just felt like maybe I need to sit and do a, have a Ross McElwee moment <clears throat> where I like put the camera on a tripod and do a little monologue into the camera. It's just a bad idea because I've always avoided, you know, when, when you have somebody whose work um, makes such an impression on you, 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 you kind of have to go the other way. You can't do what they do. And he's kind of renowned for his witty, you know, extended monologues to camera. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons why I use a lot of music in my films. Ross doesn't use any music in his film. Anyway, um, I just got this idea, I have to do this, I have to do this, I didn't know what to say. And I, like, you know, at like one o'clock in the morning, I got really stoned and just, <laughs> set the camera up and blabbered into the camera. For, I, I remember, all I remember is like halfway through I got hungry, took the camera, went to the fridge. <laughs> and anyway, I mean, talk about paying the price. The next day, I'm showing it to the editor and the assistant editor. And they are not laughing at anything, except when I go to the refrigerator. I mean, it's the only thing. But it was just the most humiliating hour of my life. But I think, I think it's really important to try those things out. You know, be prepared to look really bad. You really have to trust your editor um, and, and feel comfortable doing crazy shit like that. You know, just um, there's a lot of work on these kinds of films in the edit room. Fifty One Bird Street. We worked on it for over a year, 
editing. Um, the kids grow up was, you know, we skyrocketed 11 months. <laughs> Okay, so rule number eight, pretty self-evident. If you're shooting it, learn how to shoot. I think we uh, can understand that one. Yeah. Rule number nine we talked about, you're not really you, you're just a character in the story, and I think we covered that. Um, and then rule number 10, uh, trust your story. What does that mean? <sighs> well, um, you know, for me, it, it meant, you know, both with 51 Bird Street, particularly with 51 Bird Street, there were so many story elements to that. I mean, just telling you guys about it. I mean, I, I, I heard, you know, laughs and gasps, you know, when I talked about my father, you know, moving in with the secretary from 40 years ago. I mean, those are big story points. Um, and I just remember telling myself over and over, that you're on to a really interesting story here. Just tell the story. Trust the story. Don't try and prove what a genius director you are. You know, don't go for laughs, you know, don't force laughs where there aren't. Just trust that the story is interesting enough and tell it as straightforwardly as you can. Um, and that, you know, that was hard to do when the kids grew up because there was less story there. Um, that's much more of a kind of chronological um, clock ticking down to the moment when we know we're going to have to um, say goodbye to Lucy. Um, Meanwhile, broken up by memory. You know, all the footage that I've shot over the years is, um, allows us to go back and forth in time. You get a kind of sense of that from the trailer. But um, it's great because memory, you can go anywhere. You can jump to any point at any time. And it was a lot of fun in the edit room to, to find those moments where it was kind of organic to go back in time. But the story was, um, you know, just a kind of bigger story of a, of a family in transition and me accepting this idea of, you know, my daughter leaving, you know, my only child leaving. And again, it's a bit of a construct. Because all you see in the film is this dad who's sort of, you know, obsessing over this idea. Um, and, you know, in real life, I was equally excited as a parent for my daughter, you know, going off to have this great life. I mean, she, that's what you're doing as a parent, is bringing them up so that they'll have the tools to um, have this great life independent of you. Right, so it's your, the character, Doug Block, is the obsessive right. dad. Not exactly. Right. You don't see that side of the real me in the film. Right, so. right. Okay, let's take some questions from these fine folks. Lady right here at the front. 